Hello? Should I start? Yeah? Okay. Okay. Well, good morning to everyone. And thank you very much for joining uh, the online conference on municipalizing Europe. First of all, uh, please note that there is translation available into Spanish and French. And to get the interpretation, find and tap the button more and then tap the option languages interpretation so that you can choose your language. Thank you very much, by the way, to the interpreters for their support. This conference has been organized by several stakeholders, Barcelona and Comú, Catalonia and Comú, Corporate Europe Observatory, the Greens EFA Group and the Transnational Institute. We will now start the opening panel of the conference in which we want to discuss about the role of cities during and after the Corona crisis, as well as the need of EU funding for local authorities to better address the challenges posed by the pandemic. According to a report published recently by the United Nations, by the UN, urban areas have become the epicenter of the pandemic, concentrating approximately 90% of all reported cases of COVID-19. Therefore, local governments, city governments have played a critical role as frontline emergency responders. But we should not lose sight of the fact that they will also be key in post-pandemic recovery efforts. European countries are in a position to foster recovery thanks to the funding they will receive from the European Union, who, as you probably know, has adopted a post-COVID recovery facility, which will transfer more than 600 billion euros to member states to enable them to step up public investments and reforms after the crisis. But what about cities? City governments have little say in the negotiation process of this fund, and they have reacted by building a city coalition to request EU institutions to acknowledge their key role in recovery programs. And actually, last week, last uh, Thursday, a number of European cities addressed a formal letter to the EU requesting, on the one hand, that the EU mandates states to better engage cities in recovery plans, in national uh, recovery plans, and on the other, they requested that the EU opens up at least 10% of the fund to local authorities. So this is, in short, the context of the topic we want to discuss today with our six high-level panelists. And before introducing them, uh, let me give you a couple of logistic remarks. First, please use the chat to post questions to provide comments about the different interventions that you will listen in a while. And at the end of the session, we will gather some of your questions and pose them to the panelists. And note as well that some colleagues from the organization might also be sharing uh, through the chat useful links and resources. So I think it will be very interested to pay attention to the chat uh, in this regard. Then second remark, if you are active on social media, please uh, use the hashtag Municipalize Europe to share your thoughts with the wider public. So without further ado, I will now introduce our speakers. The first four of them will be intervening on behalf of city governments. And to them, I would like to pose two particular questions. First, what has been your main role during the COVID-19 crisis and what are the challenges you are now facing? Point at two or three issues. And second, how can the EU Recovery Fund better address the needs of cities in post-pandemic times? You will have six minutes to address these issues. And please forgive me beforehand if I have to interrupt you when you run out of time. But uh, I've been told we have to finish punctually. So um, please do not exceed the six minutes uh, you have for your interventions. The first panelist to intervene will be the mayor of Grenoble, Eric Pioy. He has been the first green mayor of a French city elected in 2014. And he actually has been awarded with the distinction of uh, the European Green Capital uh, for 2022. The city of Grenoble will, will be the European Green Capital in uh, 2022. So, Mr. Pioi, the floor is yours. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, so um, uh, I just um, uh, would like first to, to thank you for um, gathering uh, this panel uh, this morning. I think uh, municipalized Europe is very key uh, for us. Uh, what we um, faced during the first COVID crisis and now the, the second one is that uh, cities are really uh, facing uh, standard life uh, of communities and therefore we uh, really use public service uh, to fight against uh, food problems uh, mainly and uh, as well to, to fight against uh, loneliness and uh, mental health uh, questions so it, it was very key for us to um, to be uh, adaptive during that time and there was a, a great effort uh, so last spring, uh, now I have to say that uh, the second wave is um, with this lack of anti anticipation that we seems we see in uh, all European countries uh, or almost all um, make the situation a little bit difficult uh, for us because um, uh, local government uh, uh, struggle to uh, anticipate due to the fact that government uh, didn't share uh, what kind of scenarios they had in mind. Uh, but uh, I think that now what we feel we need to do is making sure that we continue to fight for uh, against loneliness and uh, uh, to fight uh, alongside with uh, the poorest people uh, right now. Uh, but we have as well to think about uh, the, the midterm and long term. And, and that's where uh, I think really uh, Europe and uh, municipalized Europe uh, can help uh, local government uh, to, to progress faster. Uh, cities have mainly uh, adapted and transformed themselves uh, outside the frame of Euro programs and funding. Uh, as uh, these are targeted uh, only at uh, the margin, specifically uh, at cities. Uh, this doesn't mean that uh, EU, EU programs uh, would be irrelevant. Uh, EU, EU funds uh, have helped uh, to achieve a lot uh, through uh, pilot uh, projects uh, or funding of um, uh, research and development uh, or innovation. We, we had uh, the H2020 uh, strategy in general. We had the uh, urban innovation uh, actions uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, the urban and social projects uh, with the co cohesion funds uh, have uh, also been very helpful uh, and dedicated to the poorest neighborhoods uh, of our cities. However, uh, we, uh, we could achieve much more in EU transformation into a zero carbon and inclusive society much faster and possibly more efficient uh, if cities had access to direct funding, uh, because it is here that the transformation uh, will have to start. Uh, and that was the core uh, launch uh, a few days ago uh, by um, Barcelona, Milan and uh, uh, so uh, several other very large cities, including Paris, uh, to, uh, to have direct funding uh, to, um, from Europe. Uh, and, and the Green New Deal for this is um, uh, quite an important step forward for, for us because it recognizes uh, that uh, if Europe wishes to be carbon neutral by 20 to 2050, uh, systemic changes are, are needed. Uh, changes um, uh, away from our current paradigm and uh, this uh, globalized economy driven by uh, global uh, companies, um, neoliberal policy environment uh, that are shaped by uh, US or uh, shaped by uh, free trade agreements. Uh, we had a statement in our last uh, city council, which was Monday, uh, to position ourselves against the Mercosur uh, free trade agreements. Uh, which uh, impact us uh, and will impact uh, local economy uh, as well. So uh, this Green New Deal is uh, a big step forward as it recognizes that climate change will affect uh, the poorest citizen uh, and the weakest region uh, most heavily. And uh, so uh, we, we really want to be part of it. That uh, I think the messages that we, we can send from the cities the, the Manheim message uh, adopted six weeks ago by um, ICLEI, um, uh, which was signed by dozens of cities uh, across Europe since, uh, sets out that uh, actively support the European Green Deal by developing and implementing local uh, 
uh, Green Deal uh, that will bring together our citizens and, and stakeholders uh, aligned with the goals, uh, priorities, and principles. Uh, at, uh, uh, we we uh, as well fight uh, for, uh, for this. Uh, we had in mind the, the new uh, Leipzig Charter, uh, which is conclude, uh, concluded by uh, cities cannot remain purely implementation partners, but uh, need to be part of uh, the process of defining or regulatory and fiscal and financial framework at all levels. And that's why as well, uh, as uh, cities, uh, we, we can support the fight for um, uh, speculation, uh, financial speculation tax uh, that is being discussed uh, right now at the European Parliament. Uh, and uh, in Grenoble, uh, I've been calling for a Green New Deal since uh, uh, my election as mayor of Grenoble nearly uh, seven years ago now. Uh, and uh, what we achieve uh, since then uh, has been recognized so, um, uh, in our selection as uh, European Green Capital uh, 2022. Uh, but if we wish to accelerate uh, even further, uh, Grenoble uh, will need to access to funding tools that are currently only available to government uh, regions or, or large businesses. Uh, and uh, I will conclude uh, giving three examples. Uh, thermal renovation, uh, Grenoble was really expanded uh, in the 60s and 70s, so most of the buildings from this period need um, thermal renovation and uh, there is no government uh, subsidies for this and we don't have the financial engineering to do this, so uh, it's not a question of innovation, it's really a question of uh, engineering, uh, financial engineering and, and subsidizing uh, this um, renovation. Uh, second example would be uh, with circular economy and we really need uh, at local level uh, at the present time it's quite hard to circularize uh, the mostly uh, linear value chain and uh, i think here we, we do have uh, great opportunities as well with uh, what we can do for uh, food chain or building works uh, and sharing goods uh, rather than to uh, buying them, uh, repairing, uh, reusing. Uh, so here, uh, I think uh, direct European funding uh, would really help uh, city scale uh, circular economy, uh, which uh, could, could take off uh, really uh, uh, and most um, broadly that uh, what it currently occupies. And uh, last example, maybe for urban development, uh, because here when we develop new uh, city quarter uh, on a green field, it is a, uh, uh, we need to change um, parting here of the past of urban development. And uh, today uh, we need as well direct funding to be able to uh, develop right away um, carbon neutral uh, neighborhood. Uh, and fighting uh, social segregation. So if we want to combine, and that's what we want, uh, uh, social and environmental uh, policy uh, together, uh, then we really need to have uh, this direct funding from Europe uh, to uh, local governments, because that's where we shape uh, projects, uh, program, uh, we do actions, and so where it makes sense for all stakeholders, uh, whatever, uh, what they can uh, fight for uh, at other levels. What, uh, that's what I, I, could, I could share, uh, not using too much. Uh, thank you very much, Monsieur Pioi. It was perfect because you didn't exceed your time. So thank you also for that. And uh, you actually mentioned one of the topics that will be um, the topic of one of the sessions of this conference, the Green Deal. It will be actually the last, uh, the last uh, round table of the conference. So we'll be able to listen to more details related to this uh, in the end of, of today. Um, well, uh, our second speaker will be Ms. Janet Sanz. She is a deputy mayor of Barcelona responsible for ecology, urban planning, mobility, and infrastructures. And in this position, she has developed the Superblock project, green urban areas in the city of Barcelona. She has also increased the bike lanes or uh, changed the city's public space model. Without further ado, Ms. Sanz, the floor is yours. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Muchísimas gracias por darnos la oportunidad de, de participar y de poder expresar la, la experiencia ¿no? de Barcelona y toda, en todas las políticas que estamos desarrollando, pero especialmente en este contexto. 
como, como se decía ahora hace un momento, evidentemente creo que es bastante obvio que las ciudades somos la primera trinchera de donde los ciudadanos expresan y, y desde donde debemos gestionar muchísimos de los problemas que sufren la ciudadanía, sus angustias, sus esperanzas, ¿no? y en este contexto todavía más. ¿no? Creo que es evidente también que, que estamos sufriendo una, una triple crisis, una crisis a nivel evidentemente ¿no? de salud y económica que impacta en la vida de muchísima parte ¿no? de la ciudadanía de forma muy generalizada y además en un contexto de una incerteza muy importante que, que dificulta también poder ¿no? eh, concretar muchas de, de las propuestas de salida a esta crisis. Pero no debemos olvidar que ya sufríamos una crisis global a nivel eh, de cambio ¿no? la crisis climática, de cambio climático, que, que de alguna forma impactaba en nuestras ciudades, que impacta en la vida también de la ciudadanía y que ya está muy presente ¿no? y muy, muy concretada en, en muchos aspectos, ¿no? que tenía mucha incidencia también en lo económico, pero sobre todo también en lo que hace referencia a la salud. ¿no? Sabemos que, que la conjunción ¿no? pandemia-COVID eh, con contaminación tiene unos efectos todavía peor ¿no? para la vida de la ciudadanía. Por tanto, nosotros hemos afrontado con todos los recursos, con todas las competencias que tenemos desde la ciudad de Barcelona, eh, cómo dar respuesta y cómo acompañar a la, a la gente en este contexto y en este momento. Y lo hemos hecho sobre todo en tres aspectos principales. ¿no? Uno, en garantizar un confinamiento digno, con dignidad para cualquier ciudadano, especialmente a los más vulnerables y por tanto buscando eh, mecanismos para que la gente que no tiene casa pudiera tenerlo, parando desahucios, estando allí donde realmente eh, movilizando, por ejemplo, todos los recursos, pisos turísticos, hemos puesto hoteles, todo aquello que podíamos eh, movilizar ¿no? para dar respuesta a esta situación, lo hemos, lo hemos eh, activado. También, en segundo lugar, en relación a la asistencia, a las prestaciones, ¿no? a las ayudas también sociales y económicas. Hemos sacado un paquete de 90 millones de euros extraordinario que hemos dejado de hacer otras cosas que teníamos planificadas para poder acompañar a los colectivos que también estaban pasando peor eh, la emergencia sanitaria. ¿no? Y por tanto, esta ayuda de entre 200 y 500 euros mensuales a más de 12.000 familias vulnerables de nuestra ciudad, ¿no? llegando a un colectivo de 34.000 personas aproximadamente aproximadamente, de algunas de las cuales han entrado directamente también en los circuitos de los servicios sociales, ¿no? que han sido también muy golpeados eh, por la pandemia. Y en tercer lugar, otra de las cuestiones fundamentales ha sido desarrollar una transformación urbana, acelerar la transformación urbana que desde Barcelona ya llevamos años impulsando, vinculada a las supermanzanas, como explicaba ahora Eva, que es uno de los proyectos estratégicos que, que ya empezamos ya hace cuatro, casi cinco años. Y lo que hemos hecho es acelerar eso, con el urbanismo táctico, con urbanizaciones provisionales, facilitando que esa contaminación, esa vieja normalidad donde la contaminación reinaba en Barcelona, eh, cada vez fuera menor, ¿no? que no queríamos volver a esa vieja normalidad y por tanto necesitábamos sacar coches ya de forma urgente del centro de Barcelona y ahí hemos desarrollado actuaciones estratégicas en el centro de Barcelona donde pasan más de 350.000 vehículos a, de forma diaria. Por tanto, toda una actuación que se enmarca en este objetivo de, hacer, de impulsar un urbanismo ecológico que haga que la movilidad sostenible sea una realidad ¿no? y que, por tanto, eso condicione también las oportunidades económicas, que vaya moviendo a ese Green New Deal que queremos, a ese pacto industrial verde que queremos a nivel económico y de todas las instituciones, también desde la configuración eh, del primer nivel, ¿no? que son las calles, que son nuestro espacio público, que es el de todo el mundo. Por tanto, creo que es evidente que con todo este esfuerzo necesitamos un mayor liderazgo frente a todas aquellas grandes paquetes de ayudas, de recursos que se están gestando a nivel europeo. Lo decía ahora también el alcalde de Grenoble y yo me quiero sumar a ello. ¿no? Creo que es importantísimo que frente a que las ciudades hemos sufrido precisamente una afectación desproporcionada de la pandemia y estamos en una posición única para abordar esas necesidades inmediatas a largo, a largo plazo de la ciudadanía, las ciudades, y creo que hemos sido ya muchas, Barcelona, París, Milán, Budapest, Praga, Varsovia, muchísimas ciudades hemos levantado la voz 
para dirigirnos precisamente a, a la presidencia del Parlamento Europeo y a la presidencia de la Comisión Europea y del Consejo Europeo para pedir precisamente ese 10% de los fondos de recuperación y resiliencia a nivel local. Queremos participar directamente de la definición, de la concreción de esas prioridades, no solo a través de nuestros estados, sino también a nivel europeo. O sea, los ayuntamientos, las ciudades, hoy somos un aliado perfecto para construir esa, esa Europa que queremos fuerte, verde y justa. Y creo que en ese sentido eh, es lo único que nos puede hacer eh, salir ¿no? de esta crisis, de esta triple crisis que sufrimos y lo tenemos que construir desde las ciudades. Por tanto, queremos participar, gestionar de una manera más directa esos fondos de recuperación. Queremos tener eh, capacidad de incidencia también en las propuestas y exigir precisamente a esos estados que nos involucren, que no se decida en espacios alejados de la realidad de la, ciudad, de la ciudadanía, que nosotros estamos contactando constantemente con esas necesidades y que por tanto es fundamental que se nos tenga en cuenta nuestra inteligencia, nuestra innovación. Somos precisamente el espacio donde se está, se está gestando la construcción precisamente de esa Europa que anhelamos. Y por tanto, creo que es un gran momento para poder eh, avanzar en esa alianza y en ese, en ese discurso que nos permita tener eh, mayor presencia y, y poder redirigir bien eh, esas prioridades para que no solo demos respuesta a corto plazo y de forma coyuntural exprimiendo todas nuestras eh, competencias y recursos, sino que lo hagamos con mirada amplia, con mirada larga, pensando en las crisis estructurales que veníamos sufriendo para resolverlas de una vez por todas. Así que aprovechemos esta oportunidad entre todos. Muchísimas gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Janet. Yo creo que con estas dos intervenciones ya se ha apuntado hacia cambios ¿no? muy necesarios desde las ciudades. El alcalde de Grenoble nos hacía referencia a esa necesidad de abordar el impacto económico del COVID eh, repensando la economía urbana y apostaba por un modelo de economía circular. ¿no? Ese, ese primer digamos, aspecto de lo económico es fundamental y también lo medioambiental, que ambos habéis hecho referencia a ello, pero en tu intervención apuntabas hacia un tercer eje ¿no? de, de actuación política, que es todo lo que tiene que ver con la, la infraestructura urbana. ¿no? Son necesarios cambios en términos de movilidad, en términos de urbanismo, ¿no? de modelo de espacio público y también en términos, digamos, de... De, de vivienda, ¿no? Hablabas de, de que habéis eh, trabajado para asegurar un confinamiento digno y obviamente ese confinamiento digno pasa por, por garantizar el derecho a la vivienda, ¿no? Entonces, eh, ya van saliendo ideas muy, muy interesantes. Voy a pasar al inglés, um, because we will now welcome our third uh, speaker. Uh, he's Mr. Roger Groot Basink, who is Deputy Mayor for Social Affairs, Democratization and Diversity in the city of Amsterdam since the year 2018. Uh, and in, he belongs to the Green Left, the Green Link, something in, in um, uh, it's, the translation is more or less uh, Green Left. So, Mr. Groot uh, Vasting, uh, thank you very much. Welcome to the debate, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me, and uh, you're exactly right. The translation is exactly Green Left. That's uh, our party name. But thank you for, for being here, and thank you to have the, uh, the possibility uh, to express our, our perspectives from uh, several cities, because I think, and you will also hear uh, similarities in my story, Uh, uh, from the previous speakers, uh, because what we see is that cities, uh, we, we, we have the same uh, problems, the same challenges, and uh, I think in, 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 in high uh, level, same demands. Um, uh, it has been said before, COVID, the pandemic was to start a, a health crisis. But what we've seen is that it, it, it has deepened into a, a, a social crisis uh, within the city of, uh, of Amsterdam. I think that uh, we already um, faced a growing inequality, and I think that uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic has even deepened uh, that. Um, uh, what we saw was a, was a, a direct demand for food, uh, a, a direct demand of people being uh, uh, who had to face poverty, and a direct demand of people who were unemployed. We are very much a service-centered uh, economy uh, and a lot of people became unemployed uh, uh, already in the first, uh, the, the first wave of, uh, of this crisis. And I think that 
um, one of the major challenges for us as a city board is to, to find strategies to, to overcome these social uh, impacts. The, the social impact of unemployment, social impact of poverty, but also social impact of loneliness and more in general, maybe even um, the lack of perspective for especially our young, uh, our youngsters, our, our young people. Because I think that, that one of the, the, the hardest things is uh, that, that there's no real perspective and a no, no, not a real social way out of this crisis uh, for a lot of people who are bound to their homes uh, and are not able to, uh, to participate in society as they used to be. Um, on the other hand, what we saw was that there were uh, in, in, the, in the early months of, the, of this crisis, uh, a, a, a huge increase of local initiatives and local structures who try to help uh, uh, with food, try to help with uh, um, um, all kinds of initiatives to, to, to overcome loneliness and stuff like that. And I think that it, 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 it helps us to, in, to in, 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 the, in, the, in the belief that you need these structures and you need all these initiatives. And what we have uh, tried to do as, 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 as a city board was, was, uh, was a couple of things. We first tried to support these local initiatives because we feel that these initiatives could, could bring together people. Uh, but we also did a lot of things like um, uh, giving shelter to uh, all the homeless people uh, but we tried to distribute computers, for example, because a lot of uh, young people uh, had uh, homeschooling. Uh, so what we did is that we um, had projects of refurbished uh, computers and just distribute them uh, down, uh, uh, by our, via our networks uh, to, uh, to people who don't have a computer at home. Uh, and also we tried to provide Wi-Fi as uh, well. Uh, we started large unemployment, uh, large employment uh, uh, projects because we see that uh, uh, that's that's really crucial. Because uh, a lot of people were uh, were losing their job, but on the other hand, there were a lot of sectors that were still in demand of people. If you look at distribution, if you look at health, if you look at education, uh, we still have, have shortages of, uh, of of capable people to work there. So we started these these initiatives, and we also try to uh, help uh, local shopkeepers, for example by saying that we're not gonna uh, uh, have local taxes uh, uh, for at least a year. Uh, but in general, if you look at it from a more distance, uh, I think that what we saw was that um, what we have learned from the 2008 crisis is that we don't need budget cuts. We need to invest in our cities. Because what we saw is that we need to invest in the labor market, we need to invest in green public space, because I think that a lot of people really re-enjoyed re and, and um, had a lot of uh, uh, a need for, for green public space, uh, but also uh, uh, we need to strengthen lo local structures and we need to, in a sense, uh, maybe even redesign our local economy. I was very happy to hear about the, the Green New Deal. Uh, Grenoble and uh, Barcelona also mentioned that. We also started that. We had uh, a, a fund and we tried to invest uh, 80 million uh, in the couple uh, in, in the coming four years uh, to accelerate programs, for example, for solar panels, isolation. And the, the main target is not only to fight climate change, but also to connect it to the, the, to the local and regional labor market. Because what we saw, for example, we have uh, Schiphol Airport, uh, International Airport. Uh, flights have uh, gone down with, I think, more than 60%. Uh, so there are a lot of people who are unemployed and we try to uh, help them by uh, giving them a new perspective and a new job uh, in um, the sustainable sector. Uh, uh, so we, we try to accelerate uh, investments in, uh, in climate change uh, and try to accelerate programs. Uh, uh, and we also call it a Green New Deal to give people a new perspective uh, for themselves. Um, maybe the, to, 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 to end my, uh, my contribution, I think that, uh, that, that um, uh, we saw that in, uh, in, in the Amsterdam region, a lot of people uh, worked uh, uh, in, in flexible countries, that our labor market was, was highly flexible with high insecurity for a lot of people. And it was a very service-driven uh, service uh, economy, a lot of people in hotels, tourism, we were way too dependent on tourism. Uh, and I think that what, what, what the challenge is, is, is how can we, in a sense, uh, redesign our local economy? And of course, tourists, there will be tourists again in Amsterdam. 
but what can we do to make our, our society, our economy more agile, more, 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 more um, capable of, of overcoming these, uh, the, 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 these, these huge shocks that we had. And for us, so we don't have to, we shouldn't cut in budgets when we should uh, see what kind of strategies other cities have. And from that point of view, I think it's crucial that, that cities uh, uh, work together uh, 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 with each other uh, to see what can happen, but also it's crucial that cities uh, have a strong cooperation with the European institutions. That's crucial that cities have not only the possibility uh, uh, for policy uh, making. Uh, I heard uh, the, the financial speculation tax from Grenoble. It's, it's, it's a very interesting idea. So on a policy level, but also on a budget level, we need direct access. We need direct cooperation. Because I think that if you want uh, strong societies, you need strong cities. And that's why we need to cooperate. And um, I have to, 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 to really end my, my contribution. Uh, as Amsterdam, we, uh, uh, we are organizing a, a forum uh, next year, um, an international municipalist forum on the 28th and the 30th of, uh, of May. And I want to invite you all, because uh, I think that it will be um, um, uh, in a way, uh, um, uh, it will be. It 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 should um, work further on the things that we do today, but also on on other initiatives that, that have been in the past in Barcelona and other places. Uh, and I think that that it's. Uh, I hope that it can be another step in re-strengthening uh, European uh, solidarity between cities, European cooperation between cities, uh, 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 so that we um, uh, can strengthen our municipalistic agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Roger. Uh, you all agree on the fact that it's uh, key to achieve EU direct funding. We will see uh, when uh, our EU representatives uh, intervene to what extent this is a feasible scenario or not. And, and you pointed to one, uh, one, um, to one thing which I think is key, um, the importance of paying attention to specific groups uh, during the pandemic, you, you mentioned uh, young people, and I wonder to what extent we, would also th we should also think on the elderly, right? Because uh, in, in, many, in a lot of situations of confinement, uh, they have been uh, struggling um, uh, by themselves uh, in a situation where with no access with um, family, uh, friends or, or relatives, it was difficult to, to get access to um, to, to what they needed to survive, right? Or medicine. So the elderly, maybe it's also a, a group of people we should also think of. So it is now time to listen to our third panelist. Uh, in this case, uh, she's coming from Hungary. She's Tessa Udvarheli, a longtime housing activist and educator. She is currently the head of the Office for Community Participation in the 8th District of Budapest. So, Tessa, if you are ready, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to take part in this panel. It's an honor to share the virtual stage with the other speakers. And <clears throat> the perspective I bring here is from a very local level, as I work in the 8th district of Budapest, which is home to around 80,000 people. Uh, our district is among the poorest and most segregated parts of, of Budapest and our residents bear many of the social and health burdens of unequal urban development. For example, in our district, men live nine years shorter on average than in the second district, which is on the other side of the Danube, just a 15 minute bike ride away from our district. And uh, even during the first wave of, of the pandemic, according to our surveys, our residents were hit harder by the economic and health um, aspects of the pandemic than at the national level. And um, regarding the first wave of the pandemic, our government, as you may know, had introduced the strict stay at home policy, which meant that many people, mostly the elderly, the sick and people with disabilities were stuck in their homes with little or no help. And uh, the government made it officially the responsibility of municipalities to take care of these people, but no extra resources were provided. Uh, actually, quite the opposite happened. The government took money away from municipalities that were designated for operational expenses from taxes, and they also took away money that support for development projects, such as our social housing rehabilitation project. So we had to manage the crisis with less money than we already had. Uh, this was a deadly blow, together with the economic downturn triggered by the crisis. 
And uh, I think what's more, even worse, is that there was no coordination or information sharing between the national government and local municipalities regarding COVID. So basically, this meant that we were flying in pitch dark for two or three months. And every day as we woke up, a new national rule policy or procedure came into effect a couple of hours earlier, usually at midnight, which forced us to constantly rethink, replan, and adapt our work. And um, all this with the mayoral staff that had been in office for less than six months in March, in March 2020. So uh, we hardly knew anything about how to run a local government. And um, this was made worse by the crisis, but also our national government's total ignorance of our existence. Um, and so re related to the kinds of measures that we took during the first wave of the pandemic, I, I want to highlight three things that we did. In a, we did a lot more, but I think these are this may be interesting to you. So the first one was that we introduced a, a modest but life-saving cash assistance for people who were experiencing hardships because of the pandemic. And this was requested by around 2000 people in our district. And uh, we also knew that applying for social assistance can be an arduous process. And a lot of people were desperate for help. Uh, and a lot of people who were most in need of help may not necessarily be able to submit their applications for this cash assistance, either by mail or electronically. So uh, to make sure that their paperwork was filed correctly and that they get the money on time, uh, we trained a group of volunteers, local residents, to, who were standing in front of the mayor's office and helping people fill in their paperwork and submit their paperwork. And this is this is especially crucial in our district because um, in the eight district functional illiteracy still exists. So there were a lot of um, clients or people applying for this assistance who didn't, didn't know how to read or write. So we, we, these volunteers uh, could help them to actually file for, for this money. So this was crucial. And then the second thing we did was we set up a toll-free toll phone number, which was available uh, seven days a week for 12 hours a day. And this was basically the kind of main customer service of all of our COVID-related activities and services. We proce processed around 3,000 requests uh, from March to May, and all of them were around information, requests for services, COVID symptoms, access to healthcare, and a lot of other things. And this number was also operated mostly by volunteers. At the peak, there were 20 of us. Most of them were local residents. Some of them were municipal employees who just took up extra time to work over the weekend. And uh, these volunteers were continuously trained for the ever-changing political, social, and public health context. And um, what is interesting is that this number is still in operation and continues to help local residents with any, any issues they have. So, so it kind of became part of like regular public service. And the third pillar of our COVID related activities was the mobilization of around 100 volunteers uh, who basically acted like the million legs of an octopus and the octopus was the, the municipality always he helping wherever it was necessary. So they did shopping for, for the elderly, they walked the dogs of many people, of people who were in official quarantine, they checked out medication in the pharmacy and they carried loads of donations, handed out masks in public spaces. Um, and interestingly, our municipality previously had never worked with volunteers and a lot of officials, even in our current municipality, were a bit skeptical, maybe even suspicious about building a system of support on volunteers and just regular citizens because they were not experts and not trained. But in the end, I think everybody was really proud of the high quality and reliable services that we could implement with their help. And this network of volunteers around the municipality still exists and it basically serves as the basis for more active citizen participation and in development projects and outreach in general in our district. Um, so while not all local governments in Hungary relied so much on cooperation and solidarity among citizens, ours was special because we have a very close focus on citizen participation. Uh, many of the municipalities in Hungary outperformed even our own collective expectations regarding the management of the crisis. And uh, I think that even if there had been even the slightest level of coordination between the national and the local government, governments, we may have come out of the first phase of the crisis even stronger than we had entered it. Instead, we all survived, but were devastated physically and, and financially in the end. And I think it's important, this, this point is important because it shows that it's very difficult to work in a country where the national government has absolutely no respect for municipal, effort, municipal efforts or local communities. And cities alone cannot solve the crisis, of course, but we are able, able to play a central role in alleviating it. And... Um, 
As you may know, Budapest is a member of the Free Cities Alliance, which is a network born after last year's municipal elections. Uh, when, while uh, the members of this alliance are almost all opposition municipalities in, in various parts of Europe, it's not only about partisan politics. This alliance represents a new way of thinking about the role of municipalities and uh, the aim of the Free Cities Alliance, and I saw it in the chat previously, uh, the link to the letter is to convince the EU to provide at least half of the recovery funds directly to municipalities. And this way, for example, in Hungary, we could avoid the money diversion practices of the central government, which basically rids communities of essential services. Um, so for, for municipalities and for people in Hungary, this can be a question of life or death, whether we get the money or the national government gets the money. And uh, this is not, not only important because we are closer to people and more sensitive to their needs, but also because the impact of economic crises is always strongest at the local level. Um, the municipalities in the new municipalities in Budapest are very far from being perfect, and I think we still have a lot to learn about efficient and transparent operations. I believe that progressive cities and communities are key to the recovery process. And uh, even in our case, the crisis has created amazing opportunities to develop new models in sustainable urban transportation, responsible climate policy, inclusive social services, and deeper political participation. We, we in Hungary cannot rely on our national government to pursue any of these policies. These are basically all against the policies of our government. So we have to implement these at the local level. Then we have to learn from them from them and then draw the lessons and fight for their adaptation at a larger scale. Um, and uh, so just to finish, our main mission in the 8th district is to build strong local communities that are able to make their voices heard, organize themselves, support each other, and push for better public services. Uh, the first wave of the pandemic showed that we were able to respond to the crisis in a fast, flexible, and supportive way. We are closest to the challenges people face in their everyday lives, but we are also closest to the solution to these crises. And uh, I, we thought that during the first wave of COVID, we were able to create trusting relationships with our residents and could work with them not only as clients or subjects, but also as co-creators of a better present. And we did all this with a diminishing budget. If municipalities were given the necessary resources and respect, both from the EU and from our own government, we would not only be able to survive the present, but also collectively co-create a better future built on trust, solidarity, and social justice. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Tessa. I think uh, the experience uh, of the 88th district of Budapest shows very well the need to, to work within a multi-level governance framework, right? So to be able to uh, cooperate with the, the national government and, and to have co uh, coordination mechanisms in order to be able to give a stronger answer to, to challenges like the, the COVID crisis, right? So um, up until now, we have listened to the voice of, of cities claiming for a greater role in recovery efforts. So now let's see what the EU has to say. And in particular, we would like to know from our EU representatives two main things. First, what role can cities have in the EU recovery fund? Is there any room for a greater say of cities in EU recovery efforts? And second, which concrete actions can be taken from your side to contribute to make cities' demands a reality? And coming from the European institutions, we will now give the floor to Mr. Ernest Turtasun, who is an economist and diplomat born in Barcelona. He is member of the parliament since the year 2014, sitting in the Green EFA group. And he is member of the Committee on Economic and Monetary Affairs, as well as the Committee on Women's Rights. So, Mr. Rutasun, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Eva, and uh, thank you to all the uh, representatives of the cities uh, for uh, having that, um, that event, uh, for being with us uh, today. I think it's extremely useful to hear uh, their thoughts, their needs uh, in the middle of, of this difficult pandemic. I would like to start by saying that, um, as, uh, as Roger uh, said at the beginning, that uh, in the financial crisis in 2000, to, after 2000, to 2008, uh, there was really uh, a push uh, on the side uh, of national governments and also EU institutions uh, 
uh, to make uh, municipalities get uh, into the uh, austeritarian framework in order to limit their capacity of, uh, of spending in many member states and their capacity of reacting to the social needs. I think that was extremely harmful and it made that the, 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 the closest institutions to citizens with our local, uh, which are local authorities, it, uh, it make their life much more difficult. And I think I'm really, really happy to see that in the last years, because of that difficult experience, we have now more and more cities working together and asking to have a stronger say and a stronger role at EU level uh, uh, and to uh, really be uh, at the forefront of the social and ecological tran uh, transformations that we need in our societies. And the, the first thing I would like to say is that uh, we from the parliament uh, and also in, uh, I'm sure uh, in other EU institutions, we should really be aware that we need to support the role of the cities in that uh, in that capacity uh, and that we really be um, uh, all aware that without them all these transformations will not be possible so it's good now that uh, at the eu level we have a bit moved away from the authoritarian mantra that dominated our policies in the last years and that we are now developing investment capacities in order to give a different answer uh, to uh, the economic crisis that will follow the pandemic. But of course, uh, an immediate question comes uh, into the table, which is what, are, what role are going to have the cities in that recovery? Okay, we are not going now to, to uh, sacrifice uh, their, uh, uh, their financial capacities anymore. Well, no, not in all the cases, but uh, in, that, in, that, in that sense, we are not in 2010, 2011 again. What, what additional capacities are we going to give them? And here is where the, dis the, the discussion on the recovery fund comes uh, with, uh, uh, as, as extremely relevant. And as you know, uh, the EU is going to mobilize 750 billion euro in joint debt issuance in order to invest that was a, uh, a huge achievement, I would say, uh, by the progressive forces uh, uh, at, the, at the European level, something that we have been fighting for uh, uh, from the political groups in the parliament uh, since the beginning of the crisis. So the instrument is, is there, it's very important. So again, what role are the cities going to have there? And the first, the first thing that is important to mention is that if you take the main objectives of the fund, of the regulation, uh, that are enshrined in the legal text that the Commission presented and that we have, uh, that we and the Council are working now at the moment, which are basically uh, the green transformation, the digital transformation, but also other issues like, for instance, the social dimension of the response to the crisis. All those issues cannot have a proper response if, if you don't involve the cities. You cannot imagine having a, a process of decarbonizing our economies if we don't have the cities at the forefront. You cannot imagine a switching to uh, electrifying our mobility uh, and, ha and, and having a more wealthy and less polluted way of moving if you don't involve the cities. I think that is, that is, that is key. And the same goes for the digital transformation. So this is the first thing I want to say. The RRF, so which is the regulation of the recovery fund, will not succeed if we don't, doesn't include the cities as main actors. This is very clear for us. Now, how to do that? Um, in our uh, assessment in the parliament, the proposal of the commission was too weak in that regard. That the, the definition of the role of the cities in the regulation was not enough. And uh, uh, we have been pushing uh, uh, here in the parliament to strengthen that. And I would like to thank the different mayors and cities who signed the letter uh, last week. They are directed to, uh, to the EU institutions and to the, also to the members of the parliament who are working on the regulation in order to improve that because it really ha has helped us has helped us to, um, to push uh, uh, and to make our case in that negotiations for the cities to be included. So we will be voting on the position of the parliament on the RRF on Monday. And we achieved two things that I think are important. The first is now that the parliament is asking in the regulation that municipalities are involved in the design of the national plans. And this is the first thing that we need to be uh, really, really uh, uh, clear about. We don't want member states to develop their own plans and to be presented in Brussels without, without involving uh, the participation of the cities and without having uh, the cities having the possibility of saying uh, how uh, the money should be spent. And that is now, I hope, because this needs to be confirmed on Monday, this is going to be the parliament's position. But secondly, there is the issue of the funding. And here I know that the, uh, there was a push for, uh, for certain uh, for, uh, 
several municipalities to have direct access of at least 10 percent we as green stable that amendment so that amendment was on the table to have 10 percent direct funding this is not included in the final text but we do have in the final text in the regulation that the municipalities should be uh, uh, should have uh, funds uh, a part of the funds available for them to be executed this is now in the regulation as well in the position of the parliament uh, you know that now we need to go to trialogues and negotiate with the council but this is going to be the position of the parliament on monday which i think it's a good achievement um, um, now um, if we have that if the cities are involved in the design of the plans and if we are uh, able to put the cities also in the execution side of the plans i think we can have uh, we can have a, a, an important a role of the of the cities to be secured and also and i would like to thank the representative of budapest to be with us here today because we know that if we don't have that in the regulation member states by themselves are not going to do that we are not going to have the member states involving lo the local level by their own if we don't put that in the, uh, at the regulation at the, at the local level and of course i'm i'm thinking about the hungarian government but not only so that's why this is it really needs to be in the regulation so this is what we are going to adopt and i hope that we will manage to um, to make it uh, uh, to make it uh, uh, adopted as well by the council the trialogues will start in a couple of weeks and let, let, let's see let's see where we get uh, but again uh, and i'm going uh, maybe to uh, to conclude here to, to to give room for the debate um if we are going to push through the rrf for, as Eric Piol mentioned at the beginning, the circular economy, an urban development which is done in a green way, et cetera, this can only be done with cities well enshrined in the development of the recovery fund. So voila, this is uh, the fight that we have been picking here, uh, and I'm so happy to be able to discuss that today with you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ernest. You were very clear about the possibilities that cities have within uh, this uh, uh, EU uh, fund framework. And uh, regarding this uh, the the mandate to states to 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 involve cities in their national recovery plans maybe you can later comment on uh, on the the specific tools or or or, um, or uh, procedures that uh, you will be suggesting uh, to states uh, to to listen to cities right will will it be through uh, national local government associations will there be any other specific mechanism so maybe you can comment on that uh, later on. Um, we will now give the floor to our last uh, speaker, who is also coming from the European Union, uh, from the Parliament. Uh, she is uh, Maria Eugenia Rod Rodriguez uh, Palo. Um, she is uh, a jurist, a professor of human rights, political philosophy and law. Mr. Rodriguez Palop uh, is an eco-feminist, cu currently member of the parliament, as I said, and, and part of the group of the European United Left, Nordic Green Left. She is vice chair of the Committee on Women's Rights and Gender Equality, as well as a member of the Committee on Agriculture and Rural Development. So, uh, Maria Eugenia, uh, the floor is yours. Hola, eh, buenos días a, a todos y todas. Un gusto escucharles. Muchas gracias, Eva. Eh, Ernest eh, Urtasun ha contado buena parte de lo que se puede hacer en Europa desde el municipalismo. Yo eh, me voy a centrar más en el diagnóstico eh, que se puede hacer de, de las ciudades eh, en España y en Europa eh, y la esperanza que se abre para esas ciudades como, como sujetos de gestión de, de, de los comunes, de los bienes comunes, que, que yo creo que, es, eh, que son el, el reto, el gran reto de, de nuestro tiempo. La gran lucha de nuestro tiempo será la lucha por el territorio, la lucha eh, por los comunes, y las ciudades pueden liderar en buena parte esa lucha. Decía Josep Pla, eh, en Barcelona, una discusión entrañable, una calle es una sucesión de casas unidas por el vínculo de la vecindad. Podemos decir que una ciudad es un nudo de calles, un montón de vecindades, de relaciones, sin las que nosotras no nos podríamos entender. Es un espacio relacional en el que vivimos y en el que imaginamos hacer cosas y en el que queremos hacer cosas en común. Eh, no todas las ciudades son las ítacas de Ulises, ¿no? esas patrias dulces 
de frondosos y espléndidos montes. Hemos tenido en España y en otros lugares pues, ciudades arrasadas por el caciquismo inmobiliario, eh, convertidas en auténticas máquinas de, de crecimiento, obsesionadas con inversiones caóticas y desreguladas, convertidas en agentes empresariales eh, a fin de obtener plusvalías inmobiliarias. Hemos tenido ciudades inaccesibles, devastadas por la corrupción urbanística que han generado vulnerabilidad y aislamiento. Eh, hemos tenido además en España, por ejemplo, una maquinaria legislativa que se ha articulado contra las ciudades en muchos casos, eh, provocando una gran pérdida de autonomía local, tanto en la gestión presupuestaria como en la prestación de servicios, y sin solventar el que era el problema fundamental de las ciudades, fundamentalmente la debilidad financiera, el secuestro de la democracia local por intereses privados, fundamentalmente por clase política local, empresas locales, medios de comunicación locales y cajas de ahorro, y la subordinación de las ciudades a la lógica, digamos, del el crecimiento, orientada sobre todo a la expoliación del patrimonio común, a la privatización de beneficios y articular redes clientelares. Esa lógica del crecimiento, ese turbo capitalismo, ha convertido en muchas de nuestras ciudades en metabolismos devoradores de energía y de materiales que son estructuralmente escasos y eh, con cuya disponibilidad eh, no podemos contar. Eh, sabemos que en este tiempo se ha agudizado enormemente la polarización, la segregación y la desigualdad en las grandes ciudades y eh, sabemos también que eso puede revertirse que se puede gestionar bien los comunes como el agua, la energía, el suelo, esos comunes que han estado expropiados permanentemente a base de ventas, de externalizaciones, de partenariados públicos privados. ¿no? Precisamente hay algunas buenas prácticas que quisiera destacar en este sentido, lideradas en buena parte en España por Barcelona, en concreto por el gobierno de Barcelona en Común, y en Madrid en su momento por eh, la plataforma ciudadana Ganemos. Voy a mencionar también otras buenas prácticas que he encontrado en otras ciudades europeas. Eh, para empezar, diría eh, que hay que fijarse en la operadora eléctrica, por ejemplo, que se diseñó en eh, Barcelona y en Pamplona para abaratar el precio de la energía y para impulsar también un tránsito a un modelo energético más justo y más sostenible. Hay muchas ciudades en España que han luchado en procesos judiciales por el control sobre las condiciones sociales y ambientales de la contratación pública, en algunos casos con éxito, en otros casos no. En Barcelona, y lo tenemos, no sé si ellos lo han contado, pero si no lo cuentan ellos, lo contaré yo, han hecho una lucha absolutamente increíble en favor de la igualdad y la equidad de género, en favor de la justicia de género. Han abierto un centro municipal LGTBI, que es un ejemplo para, para toda Europa, y hoy se puede decir que Barcelona es una bandera del municipalismo en Europa. De hecho, el Parlamento Europeo la ha considerado una de las ciudades inteligentes eh, que lideran en, en, la Unión, en la Unión Europea. ¿no? En Madrid, en su momento, se creó una zona ecológicamente sostenible en el centro de la ciudad, Madrid Central, que hubo un intento de revertir, pero que eh, hemos ganado también esa batalla eh, en Europa. Puedo contar eh, los procesos de remunicipalización del agua que se han dado en muchas eh, ciudades, París, Grenoble, por ejemplo, en Europa, pero también fuera de Europa. Y esos procesos de remunicipalización del agua, que son buenas prácticas, se han dado todos por factores que están relacionados. Estoy hablando de más de 180 procesos de remunicipalización del agua en todo el mundo. Todos los factores han sido, como digo, bajo rendimiento de las compañías privadas, inversión insuficiente, conflictos sobre costes operacionales e incrementos de precio, aumento astronómico de facturas del agua, dificultades en la supervisión de los operadores privados, falta de transparencia financiera, recortes de plantilla y mala calidad de los servicios. La gestión privada de los comunes, en este caso concreto del agua, ha resultado ser opaca, excluyente, cara e ineficiente. Son ejemplos de buenas prácticas los de algunas ciudades, como digo, Grenoble, París, pero también Berlín, 
eh, Indianápolis, Maputo, Acra, en lugares muy diferentes del mundo que han remunicipalizado el agua. Podría contar también, como buena práctica y de la mano también de plataformas ciudadanas, el ejemplo de Belgrado, una ciudad que, que, que creó una plataforma ciudadana, Nadavimo Beograd, que eh, denunció la privatización y la especulación en las orillas del Danubio. No sé si recordáis el icono del pato eh, que iba por todos los barrios y distritos indicando los focos de especulación urbanística y movilizando a la gente para decidir sobre sus barrios. Tenemos el caso de Varsovia, la lucha de las mujeres, los lunes negros, que ha conseguido eh, frenar eh, bueno, pues al, todo el movimiento antielección que ha representado el gobierno autoritario de Polonia. Lo frenó en 2016, lo ha vuelto a frenar ahora eh, en lucha por sus derechos sexuales y reproductivos. Eh, ha vuelto a frenarlo ahora, decía, eh, con la sentencia del Tribunal Constitucional de hace poco, que quería eh, eliminar la causal de aborto eh, por malformación fetal. Son buenas prácticas también las de Mésina, el movimiento Cambiamos Mésina Davaso, que logró la alcaldía eh, durante cinco años y que se vincula con, con la plataforma No Ponte, eh, que se opuso al puente que quería construir Berlusconi entre Mésina y La Calabria, un puente con graves repercusiones medioambientales, económicas y sociales. En Mésina se creó el primer laboratorio o se institucionalizó el primer laboratorio de los comunes. Y tenemos en Nápoles el primer referente que convirtió un centro social en un bien común para la ciudad. En Lisboa, Ciudadanos por Lisboa, en 2007 se creó esta plataforma que tenía como ejes la lucha por la vivienda, la salud, la educación, los derechos sociales y otra forma de movilidad. Y tenemos eh, Morar en Lisboa, que también ha hecho una enorme eh, lucha por la política de vivienda, como se ha hecho también en Barcelona, eh, en la lucha contra los desalojos y los desahucios. No sé, Eva, cómo voy de tiempo, te veo que te arrimas ahí y igual voy mal de tiempo. ¿Me puedes indicar si quieres con minutos los dedos? ¿eh? Me queda un minuto, bien. Quería eh, poner de manifiesto que estas ciudades rebeldes, estas ciudades combativas que ahora confluyen en este tipo de actos, pero que también confluyeron hace tiempo pues, en, en la reunión que se hizo en Barcelona de Ciudades Sin Miedos, que se reflejaron en ese Aldas del Cambio que también hizo eh, Barcelona en común. Eh, esas ciudades eh, rebeldes son ciudades que tienen como eje, diría cinco puntos, y lo voy a dejar aquí para después desarrollarlo si queréis. En primer lugar, la apuesta clarísima por la radicalización democrática que supone más participación, más mecanismos de control y de rendición de cuentas, gobiernos abiertos y transparentes, gestión coparticipada de los servicios públicos. En segundo lugar, una apuesta por la redistribución de la riqueza que supone atacar claramente al capital especulativo. Cuando hablamos de propiedad privada tenemos que tener en cuenta que solamente la propiedad privada que tiene utilidad pública y función social es una propiedad privada legítima. La demás, la que procede del capital especulativo, es ilegítima porque, por definición, no tiene una función social ni una utilidad pública. Por lo tanto, hay que luchar contra la especulación. En tercer lugar, la descentralización, la lucha por la autonomía local. En cuarto lugar, la identidad y el reconocimiento, políticas de memoria, saber qué debemos a otros y saber qué le vamos a dejar a otros. Una política, por tanto, intergeneracional. En quinto lugar la feminización de la política y termino, que supone favorecer los encuentros, favorecer el relato común, favorecer el empoderamiento de los barrios y distritos. Lo más importante para los municipalistas y para las municipalistas, entre las que yo eh, tengo el gusto de encontrarme, es la vecindad, no la ciudadanía. La vecindad, que es lo que te une a otro en un hacer en común y en una actividad compartida. Es importante eh, que todas estas ciudades rebeldes, todas estas ciudades combativas puedan confluir de forma cooperativa en encuentros como este para seguir trabajando precisamente junto a los movimientos sociales eh, en una política que sea más coparticipada, más policéntrica, más transversal y más transformadora. Muchas gracias.
Muchísimas gracias, María Eugenia. Vamos, has hecho un compendio magnífico de, de varias políticas urbanas ¿no? que se podrían implementar. Y me quedo quizás con, con la idea con la que has empezado, ¿no? que no había salido hasta, hasta este momento, la idea de los bienes comunes, ¿no? tan importante en un contexto digamos, de privatización de tantas cosas y de un modelo económico que, que finalmente digamos, eh, no, no está pensado para, para garantizar la vida digna de las personas. ¿no? Y yo creo que esta idea de los bienes comunes nos enlaza muy bien con la narrativa del derecho a la ciudad. ¿no? Estamos hablando de varias políticas que al final lo que pretenden es garantizar una vida digna en las ciudades, un, un modelo urbano pensado para las personas y yo creo que en esto el derecho a la ciudad nos puede también ayudar ¿no? a, a pensar en una posible hoja de ruta para cambiar, para forjar este cambio, digamos, de, o avanzar hasta este, hasta este, hacia este cambio de paradigma tan necesario y al que todos, digamos, habéis apuntado. ¿no? Uh, me paso al inglés ahora. Um, we have uh, like 22 minutes, minutes left uh, for the debate and I will uh, invite our speakers to intervene uh, with the order they want. Uh, we have been gathering your questions and I will select a couple of, of them. Uh, the first one uh, would be more related to what the representatives from cities have been um, explaining to us. And uh, the first question would be from your perspective, uh, when claiming for a great acknowledgement before the EU, do you think it is more effective to build ad hoc city coalitions Uh, rather than to use already existing city networks like uh, Eurocities, for instance, in order to, to make your voice heard. As it was said by uh, Mr. Urtasun and myself, uh, there is this letter that was published uh, last Thursday uh, and, and which was addressing uh, EU institutions to uh, ensure a bigger role of cities in EU funding. Do you think this ad hoc city coalition is more effective than using already existing city networks? And then the second question would be uh, directed to um, our EU representatives. Uh, you've already explained very clearly, um, uh, basically Mr. Urtasun in his intervention, uh, which, uh, which room for maneuver there is uh, so that uh, cities can have a greater role in EU funding. But we have not mentioned so far Uh, the role of uh, the Committee of the Regions. Do you think he, the, the, its role should be enhanced so that cities are better represented uh, within the EU? And how could it be enhanced? Uh, maybe should it be reformed and divided into two chamber, chambers, one for the regions and another one for cities? Or another example or another idea to, to elaborate on, should the opinions of the Committee of the Regions be binding when a, a EU policy or fund has a territorial uh, or urban impact. So these would be the two questions I would invite our speakers to, to, uh, to answer or to address. Um, and feel free to intervene uh, with the order that you want. Do you want me to start? Wonderful. Yeah, okay. Um, First, there was, there was a, a question by somebody on the, on, uh, in the chat uh, asking who votes on Monday. Okay, on, on Monday we we have the the, the economic affairs committee, which uh, of which I'm member, and the budget committee adopted adopting the position of the parliament uh, when it comes to the regulation for the recovery fund. And there is where we have these two components I mentioned to you of uh, in the regulation having the cities uh, being consulted, and secondly having a part of the funds. Uh, asking member states to have part of the funds being executed directly by city so this we, we vote on monday at the committee level uh, and then we will go directly to the to the plenary Mo most probably we will not have a, a vote in the plenary because the committee will give the direct mandate to go to negotiate in the trialogues with the council okay but just for you to be aware this is in uh, and um, and um, particularly this is thanks to the pressure that the, that the cities have been putting and the letter that, that, that was sent last week helped a lot in order to achieve that so uh, really thanks for that um now on the on on, on and and then you you asked me ever before on uh, to, to, to better explain the mechanisms huh? so so basically what we uh, have in the regulation is that 
um, there is a whole chapter, it's a couple of articles, very long ones, saying how member states should develop their national plans to apply for the fund. Okay, so basically every, every member state will be developing a national plan and will be presenting it to the European Commission. And basically the plan will say, this is how I will spend the money. Okay, so in that phase of drafting the plan, now the regulation, um, the regulation sets a certain level of criteria. For instance, uh, the plans have to reserve 37% uh, of the spending for climate, for to, to, to fight climate change. So this is one of the very uh, different requirements. And now we have a requirement saying you need to consult stakeholders, including cities. Okay, so this is now in, in the position of the parliament. Eh? Now we need to negotiate with the council, but in the position of the parliament. So this is already good. But the second phase is also how you execute all this. So the design is one thing. The other thing is how you execute all this. And then also in the execution part of the, uh, in the regulation, we say that uh, a part of the fund has to be reserved to be executed by, uh, by the local level. Okay, so we have this, th these two elements and this is how the regulation establishes it. Eh? So uh, um, let's see what the council says, but uh, one important thing to bear in mind, the parliament will ad adopt that, but we will probably need the pressure to continue afterwards at the trialogue level. So this is gonna be important. And finally, last point, uh, your question on the committee of regions. I I I'm all for it, I think that it's a very useful tool, uh, not the only one. I mean, we have different uh, kinds of tools on how the cities are represented. We also have EuroCities and we have uh, other kind of networks that have uh, emerged in the last years. All of this is very uh, useful. The the, it's true that the Committee of Regions has a more more structure, structured role in how and in, 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 um, in, in, in the development of the legislation at the EU level. And of course, I'm all for uh, reinforcing its role. Uh, I think that uh, th this, this would be very useful also for, the, uh, for all these th different discussions that we have, because of course, every time we receive an opinion of the Committee of Regions, it goes into the right direction of reinforcing uh, your role as a citizen inside the EU legislation. So who would like to, to intervene? Janet? Muchas gracias, Eva. Yo creo que también en relación a, a la pregunta que, que nos hacías directamente a las ciudades y que ahora Ernest de alguna forma también abordaba ¿no? en relación a, a lo que se está planteando en el marco del Parlamento Europeo y cómo puede impactar en el, en el Consejo, yo creo que eh, en relación a si nos sirven o no nos sirven las redes actuales existentes como Eurocities o otras, Yo creo que estas redes son útiles para que nos encontremos, para que compartamos experiencias, para unificar posicionamientos ¿no? en, en muchos sentidos. Pero también creo que tenemos que hacer un salto de escala. Y en ese sentido, eh, no se trata solo de que se nos escuche la voz, ¿no? que es un poco lo que se hace desde estas redes conjuntas, sino realmente de, de formar parte de la toma de decisiones de hacer ese salto a que las ciudades realmente podamos tener un espacio eh, ¿no? cara a cara con la Unión Europea, con todos los organismos que conforman la Unión Europea, porque somos el, el, somos el espacio donde se ponen a prueba las decisiones europeas. O sea, los estados no existen territorialmente sin las ciudades, sin los pueblos y, los, y las ciudades que los conforman. ¿no? Entonces creo que ahí es súper importante que tengamos esa de, ese, ese espacio. Por ejemplo, yo ahora pensaba dos claros ejemplos ¿no? con la contaminación. Nosotros somos quienes deberemos ¿no? paliar los efectos de la contaminación y cumplir las normativas de la Unión Europea, pero no formamos parte cuando, por ejemplo, tenemos en el caso de Barcelona una agencia de salud pública que mide anualmente cuántas muertes se podrían evitar si los niveles de contaminación fueran más bajos. ¿no? Entonces, para determinar qué niveles son aceptables, debemos poder participar de ese proceso de trabajo. ¿no? O, por ejemplo, cuando hablamos contra la, para garantizar el derecho a la vivienda y contra la especulación, con las Golden Visa. Las Golden Visa impactan, por ejemplo, en nuestras ciudades y facilitan esos mecanismos opacos, ¿no? incluso a veces mafiosos, que facilitan esa, ese, ese, que, 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 que lleguen fondos eh, económicos que facilitan la residencia sin pasar por ningún tipo de, de, ¿no? de, de espacio democrático ni, ni nada. Y, y en cambio lo deciden los estados gracias a un paraguas de, de que no existe una legislación europea que ponga freno precisamente esa especulación. Por tanto, somos las ciudades quienes tenemos que hacer frente a la turistificación, a la gentrificación, a todos los problemas que impactan en el derecho a la, a la vivienda, pero en cambio cuando se plantean ¿no? eh, legislaciones o directivas 
pues después no podemos, no tenemos ese, ese mecanismo directo de ser ¿no? decision makers. ¿no? Para mí es un poco pasar ese salto de, de, de ser eh, escuchados a ser parte de quien toma las decisiones. Por tanto, sí, sigamos participando en esos espacios, porque además, como decía antes María Eugenia, creo que es importante pensar que no todas las ciudades pensamos igual y no todas las ciudades hacemos lo mismo, que creo que tenemos una red también eh, muy fuerte de que compartimos problemáticas y que estamos buscando las mismas soluciones, pero siempre pues, hay colores eh, diversos ¿no? también en esos gobiernos, <ríe> pero creo que Creo que es importante mantener esos espacios de encuentro colectivos, pero después también tejer unas alianzas mucho más estratégicas para incidir, para incidir directamente. Muchas gracias, Janet. Yo creo que, que en tu intervención quedaba muy claro también que es muy necesario, como también yo mencionaba antes, ¿no? que tengamos ese, esos espacios de gobernanza multinivel, es decir, de interlocución directa con las diferentes esferas de, de gobierno, también con la Unión Europea para poder eh, incidir. Eh, por lo tanto, eso nos da también alguna, alguna pista interesante para, para el debate. Uh, I don't know if uh, there is any other uh, city representative who would like to, to intervene now and comment on, on the questions that were posed or maybe uh, on the questions that you saw in the chat. Yeah, Roger. Thank you very much. No, I would like to add to uh, to the previous speaker that I think that it's uh, uh, it's essential that we uh, work in 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 in, um, uh, in already existing structures, but that it's also uh, key that that cities uh, cooperate in, in in new strategic alliances uh, uh, to make sure that their voice is heard on the policy level. Uh, and I think that from 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 the perspective of Amsterdam, uh, we should try to cooperate as progressive cities uh, in, 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 in a always changing and even um, uh, maybe even to the right shifting European policy uh, that, that as progressive cities, uh, we should cooperate and see how we uh, can com combine our forces within the structures, but also uh, uh, next to the structures. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Roger. Yeah, I think uh, you also insist on, on one uh, point that Janet was mentioning. Uh, existing city networks are okay. In fact, there are a lot of them, but sometimes it becomes more useful and more effective to build these ad hoc uh, strategic alliances to be able to um, advocate for a specific policy point or policy perspective, uh, etc. So we are seeing that uh, today um, the, the uh, In emergence of uh, this type of strategic alliances uh, is more and more um, uh, often know that, that it takes place. Um, Tessa from Budapest, would you like to, to intervene now? No, okay. So, uh, Maria Eugenia, maybe you wish to, to comment on something that was said or react? Yo solamente algún comentario a una de las cuestiones que he visto en el chat sobre migraciones. Eh, las ciudades eh, hicieron y hacen eh, mucho en favor, digamos, del refugio y el asilo. Eh, se creó en su momento una red de ciudades refugio. Eh, Barcelona y otras ciudades con, con puerto ofrecieron puerto seguro a embarcaciones que estaban a la deriva en el mar y que estaban siendo repelidas por Frontex, por la, la Guardia Costera eh, de la Unión Europea, mmm, respondiendo mucho antes y mucho mejor que buena parte de los gobiernos en Europa. Eh, no hablo únicamente del de, eh, gobierno italiano en su momento, Salvini, eh, sino incluso del propio eh, gobierno español, el gobierno de ese, de ese momento. También han hecho una lucha eh, considerable para que se cerraran los CIEs. Esto ha pasado con el CIE de la Zona Franca en, en Barcelona y eh, en Madrid también con el CIE de Aluche, que fueron muy criticados. Los CIEs son los centros de internamiento de extranjeros y se han autocalificado como ciudades de acogida eh, bueno, en un estado, en cierto modo, de rebeldía muchas veces respecto de la propia legislación eh, interna en 
este caso nuestra ley de extranjería, o el, el, la, las propias posiciones que se mantenían en ese momento desde la Unión Europea. Por cierto, posiciones que se han seguido manteniendo en el pacto migratorio que se acaba de presentar el 23 de septiembre. Lo digo respondiendo a la inquietud que aparecía en el chat sobre qué habían hecho, qué podían hacer las ciudades en relación a, la, a las migraciones, especialmente de personas eh, en situación irregular. Eh, hay que decir además que los servicios públicos, servicios sanitarios y demás en, en muchas ciudades se han abierto a migrantes irregulares en situación, de, de, en situación irregular, eh, también en contra de eh, la, la dirección adoptada en su momento por el gobierno, en el caso de España, por el gobierno español. De manera que eh, sí que ha habido y hay eh, reacción por parte de las ciudades muy positiva y muy favorable a, a la defensa de los derechos de las personas migrantes. ¿Eh? No es, no es, las, las ciudades se han aliado también con el movimiento por el clima y se han aliado, como he dicho antes, con el caso de Varsovia, con eh, el movimiento eh, feminista. Eh, son precisamente las instituciones más locales, las más porosas, eh, a la interacción con los movimientos. Y sin esa interacción con los movimientos, eh, poco, se puede, poco se puede hacer. Eh, esto, esto me parece importante. Y en relación a si las redes que tenemos son útiles, yo, yo creo que son útiles, pero desde luego no sobran eh, articular redes de carácter temático que puedan vincular a unas ciudades y otras en relación a un foco común, a un foco de trabajo común, como es este caso, por ejemplo, que menciono de las ciudades refugio. Muchas gracias, María Eugenia. De hecho, en su momento también uh, se dio ¿no? una de estas alianzas estratégicas en materia de vivienda, ¿no? que de hecho la ciudad de Barcelona, junto con otras, uh, estaban impulsando, en este caso, a nivel global, no a nivel de la Unión Europea, pero sí a nivel global. Um, I don't know if the mayor of uh, Grenoble is still here with us. Um, if so, I would invite him to maybe react or, or answer to some of the questions or just uh, highlight uh, any final idea he would like to share with us. Yes, my name is Klaus Hapfast. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, excuse Eric Piol, who a few minutes ago had to leave for another meeting. Uh, I'm the vice mayor in charge of uh, Alia European Matters, and Eric has asked me to tell you that he found it striking how similar the situation with respect to COVID is in all these cities across Europe. And also, how similar the challenges are facing in respect to access to capital, access to funding and regulatory environment. A second point, which is very important, and this has been said by Maria, is that public services and utilities are key to transforming our cities. And when I say public, of course, they have to be managed by cities and citizens, not by business. So water, heating, transport, all these utilities and services are key in our cities. We manage them as cities, but then, Utilities will also need access to capital and they will need access to funding. This is often not the case, uh, in particularly when it comes to European funding or to the funding from the European Western Bank. You would expect that these public utilities will be also part of the recovery plan. And the third point, indeed, uh, to take up what Ernest said, uh, the cities have to be part of the national negotiations with the European Commission and the European Union when it comes to the implementation of the recovery plan. Uh, and this is what, what Eric Kjol said in his introduction. We are not just implementation partners. When the recovery plan will be negotiated between the national governments and the uh, European Union, this has to be part of the negotiation. And all the European member states Of course, there are structures in place where the cities already come together. It's France, European, here in France. And of course, uh, this is very important that at this level, uh, in addition to the European networks of cities, we have participation of the cities 
in the implement, not only the implementation, but also in the decisions of what they can work out. Thank you very much. Is there any final comment or thought uh, any of the speakers would like to share with us before we close the session? We have three minutes left. No? I well, um, uh, Eva, yeah. I, I, can, I can only say that um, I, it will be good that uh, that uh, after the parliament votes on Monday, that the, the, the cities really continue pushing their governments, the commission and the EU institutions to have in the regulation the, the role of the cities well, well and right. Uh, just I would like to invite everybody to be aware that this battle is not over, that we have still a couple of months ahead of us and that we will continue. Uh, we will have to continue working on it. And I think that the letter was very useful, but that this battle has to go on in the coming weeks. So we just for everybody to be aware that we need your support. Thank you very much. So we are about uh, to, to finish uh, already. And I think uh, we had a really rich conversation. Thank you so much to all the speakers because they were, first of all, they were very strict uh, with their time. So thank you for that. And also all their feedback and, and input were really interesting. And I think uh, to, just to highlight a couple of ideas, I think one key issue that you mentioned is that uh, the COVID crisis showed that we need to, to foster uh, another urban model, an urban model that uh, pushes a circular economy, for instance, which is uh, also environmental friendly. Uh, we also need to change the patterns on mobility, also rethink urban spaces so that they are greener. Also, we need to uh, boost uh, social policies for those um, in most uh, need, uh, as well as the labor market, as uh, the representative uh, from Am Amsterdam was mentioning. And also, it's, it's key to move towards a digital trans transformation. Digital transformation and uh, an, a, a green transition are actually two of the key aspects that the EU Recovery Fund wants to, to boost. So we have an opportunity here. And the second idea to highlight is that at EU level, it is key to listen more and better to cities. Uh, so far, cities have not had uh, a say in the negotiation process, but we see that the parliament is listening to the demands of cities. So uh, it is key to continue uh, making the voices of cities heard publicly at the EU level through initiatives like the, the, the letter that was published uh, last week. And let's see if these two um, spaces that we, we might have for a greater involvement, uh, involvement uh, of cities is actually uh, adopted uh, by the EU. The first one would be uh, have the opportunity to have a greater say in national recovery plans. Let's see to what extent cities can be consulted, but not only consulted, also, if they can um, be participating in the process of decision making. And the second idea would be, let's see if there is any possibility to have access to the direct funding. It seems uh, that maybe that would be difficult, difficult at the EU level, but as Ernest was highlighting, maybe within national recovery plans, they can at least have uh, access to some of the funds uh, granted to, to, to governments uh, for direct execution. So let's see if the second option would be feasible or not. As Ernest, Ernest say, the next uh, few weeks will be key in this regard. So uh, the, the, the political alliances between cities and the pressure that they might um, do uh, at the EU level uh, will be key. So uh, without any further comment, uh, I would like to thank again our speakers. They were really uh, great. Uh, we had a really rich discussion and I invite you all to continue connected to the conference because we will have two uh, other sessions uh, in a while, uh, one on housing issues and another one on uh, the new Green Deal. So thank you very much to the audience as well, to the interpreters and uh, we keep in touch. Thank you.